on the last strike, smack on. around for some time, John and I, for somebody from the artillery regiment, from the gunners, uh, to tell us their story. And um, I'm happy to say we've managed to find John Bolter in England, um, and nobody better than John to tell us the gunner's story. He was in the thick of it from 1970 to 1980. So uh, he, he knows what went on. Uh, John ended up as a, as a warrant officer. Um, and some very interesting stories. But John, um, well, thank you very much for your time this morning. Pleasure. John, uh, tell us how you ended up in the artillery, in the Rhodesian artillery, your, your journey. Well, from the British Army, I, I ended up at the School of Infantry as a um, course. And so you, sorry, you, were, you were born in Rhodesia, but went to the British Army? I was born in Rhodesia, but I wanted to join the Rhodesian Army, but in those days, in 1959, you had to have parents' permission if you were under 21 to join the Rhodesian Army. And my parents refused. So I said, well, I'm going to go to England. And they, my father said, that's fine. So off I went to England and I signed up in the British Army. I ended up in the Royal, Ar Ar in the Royal Armoured Corps. And I did six years serving with them. And I was an instructor, ended up as a gunnery instructor in my regiment after doing courses in England. And I went, applied to Rhodesia House before, if I could read, if I could join the Rhodesian Army. And they said, yes, pop, when you're on, in London, pop in. So I popped into the Rhodesia House and they said, there you are, here's an airplane ticket. Get on the plane and go back to Rhodesia. So, what year was that? Sorry? I was in just uh, end of January, January 66. So I, January 66, okay. I got, I got to Salisbury. And they said, yes, you're in the army, sign, but there's no armored, there's no armored cars anymore. We've disbanded them. You're now in the infantry. So I said, thank you very much. I, I know, know nothing about infantry. They said, well, that's easy solved. You go, you go off to, the, to Grello now and do a six month instructor's course in drill, weapons and um, tactics, which I did. And at the end of that six months, I was, trans I was posted to the newly formed cadet wing. In at the, at the school of uh, infantry, where it was right. training not only regular cadets but also national service cadets. <laughs> I did three years there, and then I was tra transferred to RLI as a troop sergeant. I was in, in there for all of six months when I got told to go to uh, to artillery. Walked into artillery, and they said, "We've got a gunnery instructor." I said, "No, you haven't got an artillery gunnery instructor. You've got a." Armored fighting vehicle gu in gunnery instructor. So I went to Potchestrom and was trained in Potchestrom. How long was that course, John, down in Poch? I, I did a gunnery course, one course in gunnery, and that was on the 25 pounders and five fives and the sextons. But thereafter that, I did all my, I trained myself in, uh, in, in, uh, in Salisbury. I went and did all my, uh, my own personal training in Salisbury, doing the technical side, the survey, the OP work. I did that myself. I did not go. Other blokes, some other people went down and we taught, we taught each other what to do. And right. That's how we got, that's how we got this. Otherwise, what, what weaponry did you have available to you at that time in the Rhodesian artillery? Uh, I, the, only, the Rhodesian artillery had 25 pounders. Until the late 70s, we, we, we got... Um, Eight to uh, five fives, and that's only guns. That was the only guns they had. If some people only read in books, we had one of fives. We had this and that. We, that's all we had: twenty-five pounders and five and five fives. And the mortars, the mortars didn't come into your. Uh, no, we, uh, we the Germans. They wanted the uh, army headquarters. Ended up with some mortars, the one twenty mortars. They said we must come and evaluate. They were old German. 
120 mortars, terrible things. Um, <laughs> and so we just said, let's just laugh it off. It only had a range, had a range of a thousand, a thousand plates more than an 81. Um, so we, okay. that, that was the, So when you went to artillery, who was your OC? In the, in the regiment was a bloke called J.C. Room, but in the depot, we, it was a South African major, uh, which was attached. We had South African majors attached to us until 1972. Oh. Um, the, the Rhodesian army officer was Ian Puller. I don't know if you know Ian Puller. No, I know the name. He, he ended up as the uh, OC of 2 RAR at one stage. Okay. And... and uh, John, when did, when did Major Des Fountain come into the picture? Okay. When the South African Major left in 72, Ian Puller became a Major, and Trevor Des came in as a captain, as the, as the 2RC. And he stayed, and he, he, he was brilliant. And one of the, yeah, know, very highly thought of. Where had he, where had he trained as, a, as an artillery officer? He also uh, went to Potsdam for a short period of time. And then he came and he just learned to, and I don't know if you ever knew Trevor Des Fountain's a great big thing. He said, I can play this off the cuff, don't worry. We'll, I'll get through. And it's exactly what he did. He knew exactly what, and he would, call, he would call in and say, how do we do this? What do we do about that? He confirmed, he, he wasn't, didn't know anything. He would call you in. And when the other, when he was took over as a major, then that was when Steve Carey came in for three years. Do you know Steve Carey? Yes, yes. He came in and he was with us for just over three years. Okay. And Robin Brown, where Robin did he... Robin Brown took over from J.C. Room in 1972 in the regiment. And when he took over, uh, at that stage, the regiment and depot was too very, very far apart. We didn't mix at all as much as little as, as possible. When Robin Brown took over, 71, yeah, 71 he took over, end of 71. Um, everything became, we became more like one unit and people, and we, we acted like one unit. We were short of troops, we had pulled books in from the regiment. If they wanted help, we'd go there. And then we, we worked as one unit. Robin Brown was a, a great uh, man to control Ooh, wow. people, man, man manager. Yeah. John, just explain the, the TF and the regular components. The depot trained national servicemen. And that is our, our role was to train national servicemen. And up to 1970, any after the initial uh, increase in national service, the time factor we, we had troops for deployment, they were not deployed as they were deployed as infantry, but not with artillery. They were deployed as infantry with RLI. So we had, and funny enough, gunners were in, in every single com op that RLI did from 1966 onwards, up to, up to 1970. In fact, we lost the first gunner who was killed in 1966 serving with RLI. Um, so do, and then Ian Puller in 1970 said, no, we're going to detrain us. We will deploy ourselves as a battery. Right. We, we took over then for 1970, we deployed as the National Service Batteries. If we were short of men, we could pull in a few territorials if we required them. Uh, and that's what, but we used to train the National the Territorials the whole time. When there was weekend camps, they used to have, we had to go and look after them and train them. And later, and we did all, when they, we did all their training for them, involved with in all their training, the regulars. And, and it, John, um, if my memory serves, it was actually an art, it was an artillery um, section or platoon that ran down a big group uh, somewhere in the Urungui, who who may or may not have been involved with the Viscounts. That was um, no, that was not. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Do, that's you, do you remember that 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 incident? And they gave a, a very good account of themselves, uh, oh. from what I gather. That was, Ray, um, Ray, that was Ray Beamish and his, Ray Beamish and AJ Arliss and their sticks. Yeah. Um, very, I don't know really what, I wasn't there, I was a little bit away, away from where it happened. They were deployed and they were on their way out in the trucks because there's no way to get, they were driving out. So, uh, 
And RLI, RAR were in the punch up and wanted help. So they got off their trucks and went and helped to RAR and joined up with RAR, did, did that, con finished that contact, got back on the trucks and went and deployed. So there was a bit of a late deployment somehow or other. And they were walking in a donga. And they looked over there. One of them spotted these tourists coming out of, a, out of a, some calls. Now, they went around and they, they attacked them, opened fire and did an attack over the open ground. Around about 300 meters they, they, had this, they went at these blokes. And they were, if I remember rightly, there were nine of them. And they killed all nine. And the SB came and said, went through all the equipment, said these are the blokes that went to the by count after it came down. Now, since then, nobody said anything. The SB never confirmed it was or, did, it, or it wasn't. Okay, yes. And that is how I, I think they were, but that's my own personal opinion. And the blokes right. did. Unfortunately, Ray Beamish was killed. He was a leader of this flock. He was killed just afterwards. And um, that punch up that with a school of infantry had to go and put down that S, S, uh, security force auxiliaries out on the airfield and, and he was killed in that contact. So he was the bloke who would have said yes or no, but he was killed unfortunately. John, um, let's just talk about some of the specific sort of operations uh, that, that the artillery were involved in. I know Villa Salazar was um, uh, an well, area of Sal activity. Yeah, Salazar was, first of all, uh, Steve Carey, Took the first lot of guns down. Why they did it by the, the guns went by train and the trucks, the gun tractors towed down halfway down on the way to that South Salazar, they offloaded the guns and deployed. They sat there very quietly until and the role, main role was to support its uh slew scouts. And that is when uh, the slew scouts didn't attack themselves in, into Malvernia. That was when Yanni uh, Noel was killed, Dale Collett was wounded, there was a couple more. That is, and they opened up on that and shot the, got the Slew Scouts out of the problems there. They, they stayed for a while and they harassed the, the people in Morvonia. Steve Carey decided to, this, he, he was, the guns had stayed in one position the whole time and he said, uh uh, move. So the guns moved about 1,500 meters away. And that night they moved. They moved at night. That at that night, the Flamino had come across and actually tapped the gun position, the empty gun position. And they they thought they'd found they'd obviously done some script, a bit of recce work and actually attacked the gun position, but there was nobody there. Steve Carey pulled back. The next lot that went down, I took them down, was a, a bunch of territorial soldiers, a battery. They stayed there as a. In, indefinite, remember that indefinite call-up system they had? Mm -hmm. That was mm -hmm. an indefinite battery we took down. I deployed them, made sure they were sorted out, and then the territorials took over running themselves. I only went down because Robert Brown said, go down with them, make sure they sort it out. Um, then they came out, at, and in 70, that was 77, I took a battery, I took a troop down. I was told, go to report down, down there. They ran into Mr. John, Major, Major Murphy, John Murphy, he was there, and I can't remember who else was there in those days, it was Murphy was in charge, and they were doing the four-man jitter patrols out at night, shooting up, a, shooting up a position, and they wanted the guns, they would shoot, and they would shoot up this position from close to the, uh, get, the, get these chaps out of their trenches, and the guns would, let, would fire on them, and we did that for some time. And it was very, very successful. They didn't want to move. And at any rate, nobody wanted to move from out of their trenches. Then they packed the whole thing up, that, that slew scouts pulled out. And I was told to, then to support RLI. And RLI came along. I had to, to do it, I moved my position. Now, they, in Malvernia, they had no water. They had no vehicles, they had nothing, because we destroyed it. We had shot up everything. And the mine, the Railway line, I think SAS had blown up that railway line for a long way down. <clears throat> so the railway line was no, no use to them. Somebody said they were getting water by with the Scotch cart. And RLI was told to go and pick up an, a 
to de destroy this water point and the scotch card. And I got up and found, got the map and I said, no, I'm gonna come with you. Or if you don't want me, I'll send one of my other OPs. And they'll go with you. They said, no, we don't want anybody with us. So off they went and they climbed over a fence and they, and they went to the most beacon. An hour later, he came up on the radio, this captain. I don't know what his name was, I think. And he said, we've been compromised. I said, are you coming back? He said, no, 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 we're going on. But it's an old man, he won't, it won't matter much. Well, so the next thing I said, when he got close to the place, he said, he's now close to this position. And the, the gunners were standing by the guns. He then, make, he then came up and he said, help, we want help. Uh, we, we've, we've run into a company and it was, it was 10 of them. So we opened up and we opened a lot of rapid fire on, onto the, onto the um, position. And, and I had to talk to him all the time saying, where are you? He said, I'm running. I said, no, How, I'm going to fire again. How close are that rounds to you? So he said, oh, they're about 600 meters away. And so we brought them closer. And that's how we shot them out. They had two wounded blokes. Which, and they came out and we bought them. We got them out that way. Then actually, funny, a funny side of this, I didn't have a recce vehicle. And uh, so I borrowed the 2RR, which was the mortar platoon there at Villa Salazar, had a, oh, the old Bren gun carrier, which they had modified, which high sides of the new diesel motor, motor in it. And I said, can I borrow it? They said, well, you know, you're not going to hit a mine. I said, no, would I, did, would I ever hit a mine? So off he went with the, that was my second vehicle. And lo and behold, bang, that blew it, blew the little brand gun carrier. Last scene still sitting in the bush because nobody would recover it. So they were very, I was not the popular person in R2 or R2. And, John, uh, what, what sort of um, projectiles were you using on these ops? It depended on HE, airburst. It, you know, depending on what the situation was, we used. We used to, we did a, we go back in time. Our first time we supported RLI was up in the, up in the eastern border, the northeast, I can't think of the area it's, it's called. SAS were attacking a camp and RLI kept, attacked the camp. One troop of artillery was with the, with the SAS and the other troop was with the RLI. RLI got completely um, lost, apparently going in and got made contact with the and made contact. The gunners fired, and the R, it's that book by the RLI, I can't remember them. They were very, very impressed with the, the amount of shrapnel that came over the top of their heads, screaming over the top of their heads into the, into the, uh, into the enemy. And we stayed, we wanted to carry on over the border, and, they, oh, and the blokes carried on pushing in to Mozambique. We said, why can't we go? And they said, no, you're not allowed to take the guns over the border. So we were stopped. And that, of the in that attack, one of the I say aspect was killed. I think Black called Mullen, Muller, Mullins was killed in that attack. Um, that was the first time we actually really fired in support of our own troops in in the over the border. I think it was that was 75, 76. Don, um Spungabera, you guys were deployed there a couple of times, I think, in support of Salu Scouts. Uh, well, Mokas. <laughs> We went to Mukumbura. The first time we was at Mukumbura was when Chris Goff was, remember Chris Goff hit that first landmine? Yes. We on the one side of the road and RLI on the other side. Back, bit back. I went to Mukumbura with a patrol to drop them off. And an old, there was nobody there, just the two huts in those days. That was 72, 71, 72. There was two, just two huts. And then I dropped the patrol off. They came another, and they said, um, and a, a native, what they used to call, just a, a messenger, a chief's messenger came and said, the chief from the other side over there was killed, chief Bishu, Bishu was, over, was killed by Turs. And I said, well, it's not in our area, it's in RLI's area, and it's just actually in Mozambique. So I phoned Ian, I got Ian put it on the radio, told him, and he, contacted um, Mount Darwin, or he contacted one of daily, he was the OC the other side. That's when one, and that's when Chris Goff went across to, Moz, uh, to Mozambique, to, to Mukumbura, Portuguese side. And on the way back, he trapped that mine, but, but killed those three blokes. 
We were still at Mukumbu. Uh, Sorry? John, uh, Espungabera. Oh, yeah. Espungabera. Yeah, you uh, you guys were, were busy there at, uh, on a few occasions. Unfortunately, you know, the whole time we were at it, the blokes went there and we were never allowed to fire. Every time we wanted to return fire, we were told we we're not allowed to return fire. We had one bloke badly wounded and we wanted to fire. They, uh, they only allowed us to fire smoke. So we could get the, blood, the wounded OP out, the medic could, uh, could get him out. <coughs> they were not, we were never ever allowed as far as to, to return fire or at all. The whole time we were there in the tier states, we deployed in the tier. In the tier states, never allowed to deploy, uh, to fire. We, I don't know what we were doing there because we never, uh, we would go and for a period of time. And, uh, but the way that in the, all the time, we were never allowed to fire. In the Hondi, okay, we could fire in the Hondi. We went to the Hondi Valley. Uh, that was Christmas 76. Now, Christmas 76 deployed, got, got deployed to the Hondi Valley, tied up with an RAR company under Butch Duncan. And we then went across and we, had, we attacked a we su supported SAS dropping in on this tour camp and RER were the stops and we supported that. When we came out of that, they said, go to back, go down to, to Spangobero. So we went all the way around to Spangobero and there was Slew uh, Scouts. They said, we've got a target we want support on. So we started to go and they said, stop, no, it's a lemon, you can go home. So that was why. Then later, we went and deployed at Mount, um, back to Mount Cylinder. At Mount Cylinder, that time, we did fire, and we were allowed to fire, and we we took a lot of took a hell of a lot of um, targets out. How damage done? Don't know, but we did that. Uh, that was a, a big punch up. We John, had. John, my my only connection really with. Artillery and Antali was drinking at that pub. Um, uh -huh. I put in Parlor Arms. Um, I one. can remember from Brian Wishart. That one. Let's have a look. And Wish <laughs> yes. That's the one. Um, there was a lot of spirits. Spirits were certainly high at that position. Yeah. Um, but, but just tell us about, about your, um, your operations in the Antali area. We didn't have any. This was a, there was a few little operations. There were, but the gun sat there, and ne again, never allowed to fire, fire from the gun position of the Impala. Every time there was a, I'm told you got stonked, told, not, don't fire. And I don't know, there was a political thing about it, don't fire. While we were there, um, the one that in instance in Antali, a, a police uh, sport unit, spotted tours going into a cave and were in an area and, they, and that was later in the evening and he asked for fire force in the morning and I told him sorry no fire force because in fact the fire force were deploying over the border all the choppers were involved in that so the idea was we moved the guns a couple of guns down the road about about 30 k's and we stopped and got in there and at first light, we opened up on that um, tour base with, and we, we were straight, in, we, we, the opening rounds went straight in and the Aero P had nothing, we had an Aero P went in, Aero P had nothing to do because they, flat, they, they flattened everything. The police, the police sport unit cleared, what, how many casualties? We have no idea, nobody, this is our biggest problem, nobody said, you know, X number of tours killed due to your fire. Um, but we did flatten them, we know that much. And we did little things like that. Mtali was really much, I think it was a publicity stunt to keep the people of Mtali happy that there were guns sitting there. That's great. And John, um, Vic Falls area. Sorry? Victoria Falls area. Victoria Falls was very interesting. You remember when the, mount, uh, the hotel felt burnt down? Mm -hmm. well, that was due to apparently a rocket. Sam, uh, Sam Seven going down the smokestack into the kitchen that burnt the, burnt the Elephant Hills down. So that's when they moved us up there. And we had, what we had, 
our role was to look after that. Every boat that went up and down the river with the tourists on, we used to put a couple of blokes and civvies on it. And one and the guns used to follow that uh, had laid as wet, laid on as the boat went up, covering it. Been there not for hadn't been there for too long, and lo and behold, there's a morning boost with all the grannies on it, and they opened fire on it from the from Zambia. The whole of the crew of the boat dived overboard and swam swam ashore. And one of the one of the OPs grabbed the boat and took it into the into the shore. At the same time, the guns opened fire, and that was it. They fired about eight rounds onto that target. And that was the end of it. We got turned the boat around, they took the boat back into the thing. Thereafter, I'm told it was very quiet, except moving, we had to move the guns down to Kasangula. We sunk the ferry a couple of times when we were told to. And the armored cars tried, but I don't think why they couldn't sink it. I don't think they were they were firing heat, which doesn't really make a big, big hole in this. And so we destroyed, we took the uh, ferry up. Tell, yeah. us a bit, tell us a bit more about, about the ferry, John. Well, what was I, going on? They, they were just told us the ferry was crossing. And they, they, they said tourists were traveling on that ferry. So we sat back and the OP went forward and said, there it is, bombarded. And we took it out right in the middle of the lake, of the river, and it sank in the middle of the river. And mm -hmm. they pulled it out again, but but that has stopped the movement over to Botswana for a while. The big, <laughs> the big, the big thing was later in 79, and again, this was kept very quiet, I think purely for tourism. And it had, I have confirmed it. There was a crossing by Zipra, by, by rubber boats with, with motors and, and towing. It came across just by the cut line on the Borden Senator. And they estimate, uh, apparently the idea was for them to land and then move down to the Big Falls, take the bridge, open the bridge, there's only a, a small platoon, a small section there guarding the bridge, take it over and then the mechanized, their mechanized column could have come over the, over the falls. Over the bridge, yeah. There was an OP sitting there from the armored cars in the, in the ferret. He saw this lock in front and he opened up on them with his browning. But being a, they, they, had, they also were covering it as a start point. And he picked up a lot of heavy fire from heavy machine guns and mortar fire coming down on him. So he pulled out very rapidly, shouting help. He thought he was talking to mortars. But he was talking to us. And he, he asked for eight rounds fire for effect, which well, was like, the gunners loved that. And they blasted the hell out of, the, out of this lot and on the Zambian side. Um, lot, a lot of the rubber dinghies cut their toes that had motors and it could and took back for the Zambia, took, took back for the Zambia. The ones without anything were, were really, really up the river without a paddle. So they went down the river. And the next morning, Grey Scouts went out and cleared up the ones that did cross, had a few contacts and cleared them up. A lot of the blokes definitely went over the falls. And we, some of them got into little islands and the police went and picked them up two days later and pulled them off. The estimated death, casualty rate they, that was from the Zipra, in, uh, from Zipra was they reckon 300 were killed. In that, wow. in that little mess, mess up. Yeah, that was that was a decisive moment. If those guys had got through, they were going to take basically take Victoria Falls by surprise. That's right. And as you say, open that that bridge, and um, the heavy armor was going to come across from Livingston. Well, and if nobody. If it's every time somebody mentions it, they will say, "No, no, 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 that never happened. That never happened." But it did happen. I don't know why. It's only in recent years somebody's come up and said, "Yes, definitely, it happened." It's been kept very, very quiet. I think it was done deliberately yeah. to keep them. No, that, that, that OP, um, I, I think he's actually saved the country in a way. Uh, if, if he hadn't have picked that crossing up, anything could have happened. Oh, anything because could have happened, yes. Yeah, he, he was a little in his armored car bloke. And 
he did a he did a very good job. He pulled out very rapidly. I don't blame him. In the armored car, the fair of getting fired at with fourteen point five, etc. That would have take would have flattened him. And uh, he, he shouted, gave a good good reference, and there on the firing took place, and it was actually incredibly um, accurate. And I think it upset me that nobody ever admitted that it took place, and I would think that was political again. Mm -hmm. But from what we can gather from Zipra reports, they lost 300 on that day, plus mm -hmm. minus 300 men. So it was a big, it a big knock into Zipra as well. But um, that's how it, it was a great day. It was a great fight. But I'll tell you the difficulty to sort out and say what went on, because we, we never knew what was the final target on the ground. We supported people. We didn't get a lot of information back. Yeah. And uh, that was one of, the, one of the problems of being, you know, when he said, what did you do? Well, we don't know, because we don't know what our results were. You know, we took, um, we did a thing, but an artillery was not accepted in, in, in army headquarters. You know, we did a no-go zone with Ian Puller, and it was going back very many, many years now, back into the beginning. And we said, look, there's a no-go zone. Can we we'll fire into it? And hopefully, if it is in the inlet, they'll move out, maybe. And uh, you can, um, OPs can, the troops can, stop groups can, can get them. Well, we fired for one night. And the next morning, they said, no, nobody moved. Waste of time. Go home. And the only thing that came out of that was a little RER soldier when we fired. Somebody fired offline. And he little RER soldier came up and he said, Court Corsan, he said, that ground was very close to me. So Ian Puller said, what do you mean? How can you bloody well tell us ground at night is how close it was? So he said, oh, Ishe, because we got wet from the water. And he was lying by he was lying right by the Missouri. So and the airport said, yeah, yeah, it was a bit close then for you, wasn't it? And but uh, yeah, and we did the the, rec, the the depot the whole time did operations, infantry operations. We did fire force a couple of times. Uh, we did fire force in Missouri before it went to the big things. <clears throat> and we did fire force there a few times. And we did, did deploy. We did a lot of infantry deployments. Um, the depot, one one depot, but I think it was quite a good thing. The battery was coming back from Espanga Bear or Mount Cylinder. On the way back, got close to Amtali. They said, pull over, stop, and stand by in sticks. So they did. And the choppers came and picked up the sticks and took them in, dropped them off. With um, to Oreo, who was in down by Hot Springs, and they were having a bit, they were having a hard time. And they, they so I said, well, it wasn't bad it was from fire, from being trained as sitting in the back of a gun with a gun, chopping out, hopping in the chop into a chop and going into an infantry hole was fairly, fairly good. And we used to do, be able to convert that time we're talking about, um, with Beamish up at um. Mm -hmm. that, for, that's my account. that was all regular that was all regular battery national service and they've been deployed just come back recently from deployed with guns with no retraining or infantry they were now deployed as infantry again and yeah. so we did that a lot and so fascinating we, story john we thought how we we thought we were multitask and we did a lot of multitasking but we were not the army headquarters did not the Navy did not understand our uh, we wanted to they, we wanted to support RLI. That was now with Trevor Des Fountain. And Trevor Des Fountain, RLI were in Mozambique. I'm assuming SAS were there as well. You know. And they said, yes, we can take the guns. But they're not allowed to be towed. So we put the guns on the back of uh, Trevor Des Fountain put a, a gun on it, loaded the gun in the back of a of a truck. Mercedes truck, and he came to and he and this was just Trevor just found him why he used to talk to people. He got it put on the truck, and then he called us and said, "Rick, you can fire that off that truck, fire the gun off, off the truck." We said, "Not a chance." 
and it'll go, go straight through the floor. The weak will put it straight through the floorboards. He said, I thought so too. So he hopped in his car and he went to army at court and said, impossible. And, and that was how he worked. He was a brilliant man. Yes, very yeah. highly regarded. That operation, regarded. that operation in the Hondi Valley, which we went with RAR and SS. Um, he was AOP for that. I was a GP on the ground. He was AOP. And he had his uncle with him, Dennis Desfountain. I don't know if you ever knew Dennis Desfountain. He was an no. ex gunner from the, he lived in Antali. And he was an um, ex gunner from the Second World War. Somehow, Trevor got him in the chopper with him. And as they were flying around, there was a chicken farm. And they got fired, the chopper got fired on from the chicken farm. So Trevor Desfountain gave us the chicken farm as a target. But it was on charge, it was maximum charge, charge super. And we really pushed it to get, we were on the edge of our maximum range. And we fired. And we did a thing which is not convention by other armies. We always, when we just did fire, we, we fired with a minimum of four guns to adjust fire. Because if you, we came to the conclusion, if you fire, there was a gun, bunch of twos, you fired one round, they were gone. And if, yeah. even if that round landed amongst them, you had one round and they were gone. But if four rounds landed amongst them, you had a better chance of doing some damage before they were gone. <clears throat> so we, came, we did that as a convention. Um, and so we fired these four, four guns on super into this target. But all we got from Trevor this from, from, from Des, his uncle, was, hey, look and see his bloody feathers everywhere. And it's just white feathers everywhere. <laughs> and so it, it, we, you know, he was, but then Trevor S. Fountain was a fantastic character in that way. He, he looked after the troops, he really did. Do you know that he actually changed his, his, his establishment from being a ROI to a gunner? And he used to wear a gunner's coat. When, when he became the OC of the School of uh, Infantry, he used, to, he used to wear gunner's embellishments. Mm. And people should say, why are you doing that? He said, because it's a gunner thing. That was his answer. We, they, a lot of chappies did, we had a lot of recruit, when we started allowed to recruit from the national service, we ended up with a full back, virtually a full battery of regulars. We had a lot of regulars there. So from 1950, 19, sorry, 1950, 1970, when there was five regulars, to 1980, when we had about, 40, 40, 50 regulars, we actually increased quite a lot. And John, you had um, you had Brian Wishart there to I make knew everybody Brian laugh. Very well. <laughs> you Brian, yeah. What a great character he was. Yeah, so you said that uh, he, he, Brian, and Brian Wishart, and then his the other way from Tal, he was Alan, Alan Tal, Big Al Tal, Tal, Townsend. Yes. You know no. Big oh, he, he's also there. I didn't. I had somebody so in my house yesterday. Right. I knew. So I had somebody in my house yesterday said, You knew your father very well. Jerry, um, Jerry Strong. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, from Free Brigade days. My dad was actually young. He was a colonel in the reserves. Um, yeah, he, said, he, said, so he was quite involved with, um, with Free Brigade. And I think um, Jerry was. Brigade major there for a while. Yeah. And I'm told you. So we used to was see. Was your father him. not a doctor? Yes. That's what he said he knew your father from. He said, yeah. your, father brought, your father brought him into the world. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. You say, we're, having, back to we're, having, we're, having a couple, we're having a couple of drinks the other night. He said, he said, yes, his father brought me into the world. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so just, what a story. Say, yeah. That's just a bit awkward. But, but John, thanks. Thing. He just done the thanks very much. He just done the yeah, Thanks very much for your time, man. Uh, I'm really pleased we managed to do uh, this. If you want some more, um, we can do it again. And what holds we can patch up. Yeah, Is yeah. If you got if you got anything more, um, you know, anything we can we can we can talk again. But um, really pleased we managed to get this on the record.